So let's begin. Here I'll thank you all for attending today's RDA webinar on the issues of data organization. Now let me present you our speaker. Most of you will probably have heard of Peter Wittenburg. He has been the head of the technical group at the Max Planck Institute for Psycholinguistics for many years. Since 1990, he has been working with digital infrastructures. And he's been working in different, on different um, projects on research infrastructures. First of all, he's been in the Dobis Archive for Endangered Languages, then in Clarin, a project for building research infrastructures for language resources, then in UDEP, and now he's uh, heavily involved in RDA. He's one of the founding fathers, to be exact. In RDA Global, he is the chair of the Data Fabric Interest Group and chair of the Data Foundation and Terminology Working Group and also a TAP member. In RDA Europe, he's the executive director. So, oh, Peter, please go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, Katrin. Um, so, let's start with uh, what I call issues of data organization. I should have better chosen a different title, which is more more catchy or so. But let's see that we uh, can, that I can bring over my messages. So let me quickly move to the next slide then. Um, so the first slide is just uh, about something which we all know. Um, uh, so sciences, in fact, all in all disciplines, societies are very much changing, rapidly changing. And as we all know, data is one of the key drivers of all the changes. And as we also know, uh, we are reacting. So policymakers are reacting on these challenges. And uh, with and we do this by uh, having started a lot of infrastructure projects. And um, all these projects create a large number of solutions for different components. And uh, so we could call uh, the phase which we are in, we call, call, could call it an explor exploratory phase. We don't know exactly how we should organize these infrastructures and efficient ways, and how we should uh, come to a more uh, economic uh, ecosystem of infrastructures. At this moment, we have lots of double solution, which may have uh, its good side for a moment. Um, but it's also clear for all of us that we cannot maintain so many solutions. I hope we agree on this. I'll later come back to questions about this. So my my not only my point uh, point of many of us is now that we are uh, that we need to move to a what you could call a consolidation phase where we reduce the heterogeneity and as we call it the solution space. Now the question is then can we can the da the harmonization on data organizations can that help? And then I would have to ask uh, uh, or answer first, what do we mean with data organization? Now, I will not give a definition since the term data organization has so many um, um, terms in, in our data domain are not well defined yet. So I better explain by the next slides what we mean or some of us mean with organization, data organization. So ending the slide takes a bit, now we are there. So before I go into uh, some more details, let me basically let me uh, um, mention to you a few basic trends which we all experience. Uh, there is first what we all very well know the the issue with the with the V's. You know we will we'll get more volume, we get uh, a lot much more variety, and the speed of change is enormous and so forth. We all know this. This has a couple of. Uh, uh, um, consequences which you may not all know and let me just uh, mention three of them which are very important for the question of data organization and other issues by the way as well so what we all understand more and more is that it's not only the the, the data volumes which are make our world so uh, a data world so uh, complicated it's the complex relationships which we have so the old structures hierarchical structures file structures they don't work anymore, and if, and many of us know that uh, we have created some spaghetti, which is indicated in the picture, as you can see, hopefully. So the question is, you know, how to prevent to come to a total spaghetti? And of course, we all, uh, at least myself, we have experiences from such a spaghetti. So uh, how can we manage the different relationships and complex complex relationships? Um, the other 
uh, another trend is that we all like to use reuse or recombine data that comes from different contexts context sorry and and partly uh, this in the future more and more will be done done by people whom we don't know so we will put data somewhere in repositories and some people will combine data at least that's the ideal solution to get new insights into a certain phenomena and of course if we do so and that's immediately obvious if we do so and have a domain of such repositories um, the, the the strong relation between creators data creators and data consumers is broken and we have a huge trust and acknowledgement pro problem which we have to solve i think these these trends are very um, very uh, obvious uh, to most of you and uh, and of course when we talk about these trends we have to estimate what happens in 10 years or so since when we are talking about building infrastructures we just don't mean you know an infrastructure for tomorrow but we mean an infrastructure for uh, the the, uh, the time in five years or ten years so we have to think ahead you know what these trends really mean uh, what uh, uh, what complexity in our data world means what recombination and therefore the need to create metadata for people whom we don't know what that all means so one example is just you know think a bit ahead and imagine agents mostly then machines that use some profiles to find and correlate useful data so we certainly will move to a, a world of uh, of uh, data which is so uh, huge and complex that we need more and more uh, machines that do the job for us so having said this let me briefly then go back to uh, what we are building at this moment so I spoke about uh, uh, how we react on the challenges, and here I mainly refer to the European situation, but I know that also in the US and other countries, uh, similar things happen. So what you all see in certain communities, be it, uh, uh, be it humanities or life sciences or, or natural sciences, what you see is that community scientists to get, sit together with infrastructure building people, technologists, Community, community scientists create a lot of data, a lot of services, and the infrastructure will make it all available to then the scientists and maybe other people as well. I will not go into this uh, uh, diagram. I hope it's, it stands, it speaks for itself. Uh, the message which I want to bring over is actually uh, the one uh, which, uh, which comes next is that we are building so many of these different infrastructures um, so in the in Europe you have, for example, a process which is called ESRI. Um, I even don't know exactly where it stands for, but uh, this ESRI process in Europe created about uh, 44 or 48, uh, depending on how you count, in research infrastructures in different disciplines, and that will continue to do so. So in various disciplines we have these European infrastructures. Now. Um, and, and I can tell you, if you go across the countries in Europe or across disciplines or even across organizations, so I'm in the Max Planck Society, we're also building infrastructures. So there is a whole, um, how do you say, a whole uh, a huge amount of such infrastructure initiatives. And they have, of course, made a lot of good things for us. And they have, uh, we've got lots of young uh, people trained, much testing of variety of approaches to different uh, uh, issues. We have identified gaps in the service landscape and so forth. So lots of good stuff. Uh, um, this is even not uh, the full picture. The picture gets complete if you then come uh, bring in also, in uh, at least in Europe, what we say e-infrastructures. These are those um, initiatives, like uh, Kathleen mentioned, the UDAT initiative or the Open Air initiative that bring uh, um, that offers services that are cross-disciplinary so discipline independent and also of course as we know the industry uh, comes with uh, uh, services in the area of data so the whole picture is rather complex um, and and of infrastructures is rather complex and i said as i said uh, uh, all these infrastructures um, and in all these infrastructures they're clever smart people create solutions and I've seen so many of them, for example, for a simple thing like uh, 
persistent identifiers. So lots of communities have thought about this and uh, of course thought that they cannot come up, can come up with a better solution than others. So we have lots of these solutions and not all of these solutions, or you could also even say many of these solutions will not uh, uh, survive in the next uh, couple of years since there's no one who can pay the maintenance costs. So uh, this this is my my basic slide here, uh, which I wanted to show to uh, indicate the complexity of the landscape and the huge solution space. Now, give me, have, we, we have made a lot of interviews uh, with uh, scientists, with uh, different uh, disciplines, different size of uh, departments, projects, and uh, I, I just show here one slide. If you if you talk with all these peoples, then of course there are some good, very good projects. But if you go out in the many departments in the universities and so forth, you see that data work is still uh, rather inefficient. So if you talk with um, a person who is a biologist, for example, in some uh, very good institute, uh, this biologist for 75 or 80 percent of his time is a data manager. That means. He has to fight with the complexity I just spoke about. So he has to find the data. If he found the data which he was looking for, then he has to uh, bring this data together and remind what the data was about, how it was exactly structured, and so forth and so forth. So it's a huge waste of time which we see in many departments. Um, the, this, the, this problem even gets more, uh, uh, or this, this issue gets more problematic if we want to federate data from also bring data together from different institutes or different projects, as we all know, right? So doing all this is much too expensive. So the, the, on the other side, the pressure on all the departments to do data intensive science gets, uh, gets uh, bigger and bigger. But if you talk with the people, many people don't, uh, don't feel to be fit for these challenges since they don't know what, how to deal with this huge mass of data uh, and 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 um, and how to uh, integrate these in a in a more efficient ways. So if you talk with senior researchers, they all say, "Well, we can't continue like this. Too costly, too much time, too inefficient, and so forth." So what you then mostly agree when you discuss with uh, with these senior search researchers, they agree that one should move towards proper data organizations, and I will elaborate on this what that is and probably more automated workflows. The problem they see is at this moment uh, that changing their ways of doing is rather risky. There is a lack of trained experts. So uh, even if they would like to start with automated workflows, they don't know how to do it. There's a lack of guidelines and support for all recommended solutions. So, you know, on one day I will come to a department and say, we'll use this, next day another one, will come, uh, good people will come to the department and suggest using something different. So there's a lot of uncertainty what one should choose. And as we all know, if you have chosen something, you have a, a, a learning period and you invest time to uh, um, get acquainted with all the, uh, the, the solutions. So it's not so easy then to change back. So people are hesitating to, uh, to make decisions. So investments are seen as risky at this moment by various people, which is not nice. So it's a kind of contra, uh, how do you say, contraproductive uh, situation, which we, which we would like to have with all these different solutions. So let me move to the next slide. So it's not just the researchers that are uh, in, getting impatient, it's also the funders that uh, are getting impatient they also see that we need to improve since uh, they don't want to fund all these different solutions where, where they also know that they can't be maintained on the long run. So there's a lot of pressure uh, from, the, uh, from the funder side as well. And you probably all know the, the, the recommendations from the G8. So the ministry uh, group on data, make data searchable, make it accessible, make it interoperable, make it reusable and persistent. And of course, what we need to do is thinking about infrastructures, how to do all this. So given the huge diversity and heterogeneity, so how do we 
how can we do all this on these levels, close down or, or reduce, reduce the number of solutions? It's always good to look at uh, some old former example. So, of course, we had a similar solutions, so, uh, situation sorry, uh, decades ago when we had lots of su uh, different suggestions how to do uh, uh, computer networking. And uh, I just, in this cloud, I just mentioned a few of them. At a certain moment, we had a convergence to TCP IP. I will not discuss how this all may, may have happened, but there was a con convergence towards TCP IP, which was great since it completely opened a new era. So at a certain level of infrastructure building, we had an agreement and later very soon uh, um, a worldwide agreement to just use this numbering system and a set of protocols, if you want, and some registries around that. So that helped all of us enormously to bring all the computers together. And as we all know, we used, still use that today. So can we learn from this, uh, from the internet experience? It's always difficult, you know, to, to map from one uh, um, historical uh, moment to another one. So let me also call this TCP IP for what I'm going to tell you in the, in the next slides, a common component, right? So uh, it's a common component for the TCP IP was a common component for the internet uh, development. So now, so what? Uh, so here you see a, uh, my my favorite one of my favorite slides. So you see uh, on the left side you see all the small trees. So all these silos which we are building, right? So. Um, so um, in the various disciplines and the various organizations, countries, and so we all have these uh, uh, initiatives that stand for themselves and, uh, and uh, a huge variety on all the areas. And of course, when we, when we would like to uh, uh, think, uh, when we think about um, restructuring then and reducing the solution space, we never should uh, think of solu reducing solution space when it comes to scientific data creation or scientific data analytics. So there should be, um, there should be many flowers uh, blossom. Uh, but if we look to the part in the middle, then we believe, or some of us believe, that we can reduce heterogeneity without uh, hampering research. So on the left side, you see a few um, um, uh, uh, acronyms that uh, may give you an impression where we are busy to uh, reduce the solution space and where we still could do a lot. So it's about PID systems, about uh, distributed uh, authentication, authorization, metadata, workflows, and so forth, many, uh, many uh, registries, and so forth. So in, in RDA, we are talking about these components. So the, the, the idea which we all had, on, or many have, is that we can reduce the, the uh, solution space in this middle area, which we could call the management or curation or access area. So if you talk about, uh, oh yeah, that was the point where my colleagues asked me to raise a few questions uh, to break up this, uh, uh, this uh, way of uh, transmitting knowledge. So my question here would be, but you could also raise other questions. Do you agree with the need to reduce the knowledge, the solution space, so reduce the number of solutions which we have? And is the identification and specification of common components the right way to do? So uh, let me see whether you have comments or questions. Okay, so there's a comment, yes. Uh, so you, I guess you can all see it, the reduction of common components, and we have to see what that exactly is, but um, uh, let's take it for a moment. Sounds to be the, exist the easiest way and, and gives us trust. Yes, that's what we all hope. Is there more comment?
Uh, I don't understand that comment, to be honest. So reducing the space, which would be much more easier for users if they really work. Um, well, <laughs> I can't interpret that one. So whatever I have participated in, uh, we uh, or in most uh, uh, no, most uh, research infrastructures I participated in, we had a direct relation to the researchers, right? So whatever we did was were in in close contact with researchers, right? And there were different de uh, uh, gradations. So even in the Europe in the UDAT uh, research infra uh, uh, data infrastructure, which was cross disciplinary, we had the situation that the five disciplines which we, with the help of with which we begun the the UDA project that though they were in the driving seat in fact specifying the needs specifying the the features and so forth so um so uh, i'm not quite sure whether i could uh, understood the message well let's let's move ahead um then uh, I will have other moments for questions. So, um, whoops, the next slide always takes a bit. So when we talk about, uh, I shouldn't have done animations since it's a bit slow. So when we talk about common components, then of course it's very important uh, that we understand on which layer we are talking, about which layer we are talking. Where are the common components? Um, um, uh, located right so here you see an old diagram from Larry Lenham you know where we where he distinguished to, uh, four layers if you want and we are still discussing this the discovery layer so typically something about metadata domain uh, and uh, and ideally you should have in the metadata the persistent identifier or something and with help of that you should get access and of course then you have to negotiate about access permissions things like this if you get access, then you have to you can interpret uh, the data you found, and if you even have more context information, uh, you could um, uh, reuse uh, the data you found for different purposes. So we are still discussing these layers. This was just the uh, the start uh, and uh, of the discussion. Uh, but when you looked uh, uh, at, when you are looking at uh, the G8 uh, suggestions and so forth, you still find the same layers. Now, this slide, I don't want to go into detail here. Uh, the question is, is also, we have so many different types of uh, data. We call it digital objects, better said, so individual objects. Um, and uh, and if, we, if we're talking about reducing this, the space in the, in the data management area, the, the solution space in the data management area, the question is, do we need to know all these different data, uh, these different types of data? And my answer would be no, only to a certain extent, right? And that's, um, that's um, um, indicated in the next slide, and which is good, of course. So if we do proper data management, then, uh, and let's first start with files. I will come to other uh, types of data in a moment. So. What you need for data management, obviously, mostly, is what what I like to call external properties. So you need to know the the, the location where the uh, where the uh, objects are. Uh, you need to know something about rights. You need to know something about some relations. So uh, you know how is this object related to other objects? Things like this. But you do not have to look into the syntax and semantics and the way it's encoded. Right. This is not true, by the way, for metadata, since metadata is part of the, of the uh, should be part of the digital management, uh, um, yeah, of the data management area. But manage uh, the metadata area in general is much more reduced with respect to heterogeneity, so that makes life a bit more difficult. But for the data objects, for most of the data objects themselves, we can use these. Uh, this difference between external and internal properties. So for managing operations, we often don't need to look into the internals of the digital objects, which makes life a bit more easy. 
If this is true for uh, for uh, files, uh, then the question is, of course, why is it so hard to federate data? So to bring data together from different locations and uh, different uh, initiatives. Um, so I, I mentioned here a few of them, uh, which makes the, uh, the the life makes life hard for us. So we don't normally we don't know where the copies of the different uh, of uh, files are, right? So they, we all do copying of files, but where do we store the information where the copies are? Where is, by the way, if we found something, where is the metadata? How can we find the metadata? And of course, is the metadata machine readable? Um, if we use PIDs, where can we use, where can we find the PIDs? Or if we found the PID, how do we find the metadata um, and the data associated with that PID? Where to find its access permissions? So if you have uh, various copies around the different, different uh, um, places, you know, where, where do you find the access permissions for all of these copies? Do, have, do they have the same and so forth? So there are a couple of questions and normally, if we look now to uh, uh, federation projects, it's a hard it's a hard work to get all this then information uh, together to find this information, bring it together, and make use of it. So this is a, a huge problem which we all which we uh, those who bring data together from different sites, which we all face. And now I come to a suggestion: how to overcome this. So the, the, the Data Foundation and Terminology Group, amongst others, and we were in contact with many other um, um, groups in, in the, in the, in the Re uh, Research Data Alliance, we started uh, based on lots of different models from different disciplines, different institutions. We started to find out what is now the core of uh, of all these these uh, these um, um, uh, uh, different uh, um, how do you say entities um, that um, that we should bring together so that we can speak about the proper data organization so that we can speak about how we can find the different things. So you can see here in the middle we have the digital object, so a single something, and you know, that could be a file, but as we can see, we'll see in a moment, could also be a, uh, a, a query ex being executed on a database. So there's a digital object. The digital object has a meaning for uh, for people. has to be uh, uh, has to be uh, accessible, and people want also in five years to access the same digital object. Now, how what do we need to do to make uh, to make this happening? So this model. It gives an integration. So the digital object has has certainly some bit sequence or bit stream, whatever you call it. And these bit streams are stored in repositories and several obviously several repositories nowadays. So that's the upper part. And I'm just explaining the red, uh, the, the part indicated in red. All these others are additional things which are not uh, really at the core of this model. So a digital object has this bit stream, nothing new. A digital object has to have a persistent identifier. A digital object has to have metadata. And as we can see here, the metadata is itself a digital object. That means it must have a digital, it must have a pers persistent identifier. This is very important. So if you go at this moment, if you look to many implementations of, um, of uh, um, data solutions, you will not have these links. They are not provided. So it makes, so it makes it that so difficult to find the different elements. On the other side, we also say that, you know, digital objects are aggregated to digital collections, right? And or we also say that digital collections are digital objects, which is also very important since when you say so that digital collections are digital objects, they also have a metadata description and they have a persistent identifier. So in my old, uh, in my former institute, our, our uh, PhDs were able to aggregate different data for their PhD study, give it one metadata description, and call it, this is my collection, which I use for the PID, get it a PID, and then it was citable in their PID uh, thesis. 
So this model gives a huge amount of, uh, it's very simple, but already this, this small model, the simple model, gives a huge possibilities if you really implement it. So I found so many other solutions, as you can imagine, since we all make uh, other, have other solutions, but in some solution, metadata was even in, included in, in, uh, in, uh, in some uh, scripts. Uh, and of course, then it's not possible, you know, to speak about metadata being a digital object since you have to refer to it, since you, it gets a PID. So I hope that this model is kind of clear and I'm running out of time, I see. So um, this is basically the core uh, suggestion for organizing your data. So let's see what else I have here. Well, this is just a slide to indicate, you know, how you could uh, do virtual collections, build virtual collections, and you see virtual collection, collection is nothing else than a, a piece of metadata with lots of pointers. So in my old community, former community, Clarin, linguistic area, we built a collection builder based on these principles. And it's very simple. So, and here you see, I don't know whether you heard about the FAIR principles. I will not go through them in detail. You can uh, study them. I, get the, I guess the slides will be available on the on the on the website. Uh, the green uh, the green marked uh, statements from the fair principles principles, by the way, that come out of the bioinformatics field. Very good stuff. If you read the green sim principles, then they really map with what we have found out or defined in the data foundation and terminology model, which I just showed to you. So this is um, this is very good that we all obviously have an agreement on uh, or convergence on uh, principles and uh, and uh, that was uh, good to see. So what else do I have? Yeah, I will I will uh, uh, just skip this question. Sorry, and move to the next, Katrin, uh, to open the question final questions. Uh, uh, area. So, so how could you know? Here, this agreement starts. Oops, why is that moving? Well, you see this. So here, people certainly do not all this uh, agree. So some people think that the PID uh, record, so the PID information system, should be the anchor point for a proper data organization to find everything. What you see here is the following. So you see a PID and associated with a PID a number of information, and some people use even more. So you could say uh, the PID record, um, of course, refers to the data copies, so that you find the bit streams which you are looking for, you know, and you select them one by content negotiation or whatsoever. So there is information about where the data is stored. But you could also use this to store the pointers where you can find the metadata, which means that in the metadata, you have the PID of the digital object. That means if you do a search, you find the PID and you can find the PID record and you find all the other information. If you are in the PID, for whatever reasons, you just get a PID as a reference somewhere in another document or so you will be able to find the metadata as well. Some people operate with rights, so to uh, refer to the rights record. Other people refer to relations and so forth. So there are lots of people using the PID as an anchor point to organize the data um, in a way as it was shown. You can do it also in another way. The good thing here with this model is the persistent identifiers have to be persistent. And there are systems that give a good guarantee that you know, PIDs are indeed persistent. What other type is of, of what other entities in our digital world are, uh, uh, you could call persistent, so persistent as for perhaps the PID records. So this is something where some people uh, uh, hope, uh, hope on that by PID information is used to anchor all the different types of uh, data which belong together. But as said, other people do it differently. So let me come 
to uh, the conclusions or finish. So if you, this was just to, to mention, if you use the PID record in the way I just chose, show, uh, showed, then you need information typing. So you need to identify the types since our machines are stupid. And of course, machines should be able to read these PID records and not humans. So um, uh, you need typing of the information, the different information, so that machines know how to interpret the information which they find in the PID records. Um, the next slide, if you do this, if you do typing of information, you can build a generic API for all PID systems that support these kind of ways. And there is something scrambled on the, on the, on the uh, screen, uh, on the slide. I'm sorry for that. I will not go in detail here. You can read it all since these were groups in RDA which have their, uh, their outputs, generate their outputs. But it's clear, if you rely on PIDs, as I showed, you know, see PIDs as an anchor point, you should, um, you should use uh, uh, the typing, in, uh, use uh, typing of your information. And then if you use typing of your information, you can create an, a generic AP2 PID system, which is of course very good. So uh, I will skip, skip seeing, looking at the watch, I will skip uh, the next slides or make it very short. Um, if we talk about digital objects, we do not uh, have to uh, speak about files. Files make certain things more easy. But as I said earlier, you could also speak about a query, you know, that you give a PID and then you execute the PID query and so forth, so, uh, or a set of assertions or whatsoever. So there are different types possible. Um, sometimes uh, it requires more work since if you have, for example, a query, uh, um, as a digital object or anchor for a digital object, you have to make sure that the query, uh, uh, that the software behind the query uh, uh, um, guarantees that you get the same digital object, the same information back again, even after five years. So it's a bit more complicated. And you even can translate that to the new uh, uh, ways of uh, no SQL databases, uh, I will not discuss this now since time uh, moved so fast. We could do this in another time. I think that the new uh, uh, databases which are coming, like the array databases for, for multivariable time series data and so forth, that they do not change their game. There's one question, of course, what do you do if the data borne by sensors or so is immediately uh, put into such uh, array databases? Uh, well, then you have to define again queries and things like that to identify your digital objects. Um, the same as similar words can be made for the semantic web or semantic area. Of course, you must have some descriptions, original descriptions, then you could do some knowledge extraction, generate RDF triples and put them in a triple store. I guess that no one would see the triple store as the persistent, uh, uh, how do you say, uh, store for for information, but the store would be somewhere different. Maybe you don't agree here. And if it's so that you have uh, uh, textual data or metadata descriptions, then you should have a digital object so that you always can uh, point to things. So I see the triple store more as a kind of front end machine, index machine to easily do searches and and uh, inference build inferencing and so forth. So last point, last slide. Some conclusions. Um, so my suggestion would be adhere to the basic DFT organizations and data organization. And as you uh, as you have seen, if you look to the fair principles, we're all talking about similar ideas, which is good. Participate in a domain of registered data and metadata. So what do I mean with this? If you create data, put it into a trustworthy store and register the things, that means uh, associate a PID with it and create metadata and put this all together in the way the DFT model suggests. That's my view. There is a system which you should use uh, for, for uh, citation of data and, and uh, referring. There is a system called handles. And, uh, and you know the DOIs, the digital object identifiers, also are based on the handle system, but there is maybe disagreement. But I mentioned this here to just tell that there is a 
worldwide system available which you could use if you want to register PIDs. Well, my suggestion would be uh, think about this binding strategy. So to have to use the PID record uh, to bind the different uh, entities which belong together, to bind them together so that you can, machines can easily find things. Yes, metadata should be accessible, should be open. There should be no access restrictions on metadata. Um, store your data in trustworthy repositories and take care that these are audited according to the data seal of approval or world uh, data systems uh, um, uh, uh, principles. Uh, if you don't know what that is, uh, I have uh, a slide with uh, references at the end which you can use. Okay, make use of generic IPs in your software where possible and so forth. So I think um, oh yeah, the last one, um, um, in case of databases, make sure that the queries get the PID. So these were my slides. These were my, um, my uh, information about uh, the issues of data organizations. Um, maybe you have some questions. And as you can see here, on the last slide, I have a lot of references which you will find on the on the on the web. Thank you for your attention, and as I said, maybe you have some questions. Well, thanks a lot, um, and thanks a lot to you, Peter. If you have any questions, please just type them into the chat window or raise your hand on this little icon on the top of the um, Adobe Connect screen. And I would have a question, Peter. So you yeah. mentioned these common components, and I was mm -hmm. wondering how far are the discussions, which components from which providers could be um, broadly rec be recommended as common components? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so this discussion is really started almost a year ago, or not more, so in San Diego at the plenary. And so we're still discussing about this, uh, what we agree that we have uh, a PID system as a common component. I'm not speaking about the different uh, versions or uh, possibilities, but certainly a PID system is a common component. And we are specifying now the requirements for the PID system. The same is, <clears throat> uh, let me take another example. So what we are, some of us are building is uh, registries of repositories or so trustworthy repositories and there the, again the question is you know how do we how do we expose the information about a repository so a repository offers data metadata of mostly and also services on data or metadata a simple services could be you know an oa pmh uh, metadata provider service right you all know this properly so a repository offers also services on data. Now, how would you, um, how would you again for machines, not for humans? How would you um, describe the services in a way so that machines can find something? So, um, a machine is looking for metadata ports for of all the repositories known or registered. Then, you know, we have to have a schema that says, you know, okay, here's the metadata port. And it, it supports OAA PMH, for example, something like this. So how do we how do we describe the services of repositories? That's another component which we are currently discussing. I hope that uh, so there are more components like authentication and so forth. But let me stop here, Kathleen. Is that does it give an answer to your question? Yes, it does. Thanks a lot, Peter. So um, have you any other questions? If not so, I would like to recommend our next webinar, which will take place on 15th of March. Uh, Andreas Rauber will present us the, the citation of dynamic data. So, thanks a lot to you, Peter, and thanks a lot yeah. to, uh, to everybody for listening, and I hope to see you soon. Also from my side, thanks a lot again for sharing this session and listening. Thank you.